Hey guys, welcome back to my devlog series, A Guide to Making Indie Games. Each week I share a little bit of the game I'm working on, as well as giving some helpful advice on how you can make your own indie games. Today we're going to be talking about one of my favorite parts of pixel art game development, tile sets. We're going to talk about the purpose of a tile set, we'll look at some examples from other games, and then of course I'll show my process on how I go about making tiles for my own game. There's a lot to cover, but before we start, if you enjoyed Enjoy these videos and want to see a new devlog every week, consider subscribing. We'd love to have you. So first and foremost, what is a tile set? Building out levels for games can be a lot of work, especially if you're also the person creating art for those levels. The good news is there's a shortcut to making great looking levels without spending countless hours drawing everything individually. The best way I can describe a tile set is that it's basically a sticker book for building levels. You create a bunch of different tiles and use those tiles to add some pizzazz to your game's environments. If you've been watching this series so far, I've actually been using a tile set already for testing my own game. It's about as simple as these things can get, but it's still a tile set. Tile sets are most commonly used in pixel art games, but honestly they're used in pretty much any kind of medium. Hollow Knight is a great example of hand-drawn tile sets, and even 3D games use their own versions of tile sets in order to build levels. It's really just a great way to optimize for time while making something that still looks impressive. When it comes to pixel art though, tile sets still come in many different forms. For example, tile sets for platformers work very differently than top-down games. There's also other perspectives to consider, like camera position. Some games are straight top-down, sometimes the camera is at a 45 degree angle. Sometimes tile sets are isometric and almost 3D looking. There are also super simple tile sets with barely any detail and extremely complex ones with tons of variety. There are a lot of decisions to make when you start working on tile sets for your own games, but the most important part is to find what works best for your project specifically. So now we're going to do something that I love to do for every little part of my project. I probably even do it too much. We're going to make a mood board. At this point, if you've been watching this series, you've seen me make a bunch of these. Grab a bunch of art styles and pictures that inspire you and throw them all in one place. It's just a great way to gather ideas and get a clearer picture of what our tile set will look like. For me, this tile set is going to be used for the first handful of levels in my game. If you didn't know already, I'm making a speedrunning platformer about college students trapped in a reality TV show death game. And I really like the idea of the game taking place on a film set. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory is the perfect example of what I'm looking for. It's got all these bright colors and magical looking stuff, but behind all that is this rusty industrial warehouse. And something about that is exactly the kind of unsettling I want to go for. So let's dive into it. The first thing you want to decide is what size your tiles are going to be. If you have a player sprite already, it's a good idea to keep that nearby as a reference. I like to make my tiles about the size of the player. Mine is close to 16 by 16, which is a very standard size for tile sets. This is just my opinion though. If you have a larger sprite and want to make smaller tiles, that totally works too. There's really no rules to this, just suggestions of what works worked well in the past. If you're new to pixel art though, I do recommend working with smaller sprites and tiles. It'll make the steps of learning a lot easier. So this is how I make my tile sets. The process is all about making seamlessly repeating patterns. That way you have a lot of flexibility in how you place your tiles within a level. For example, as I'm making this first floor tile, I want to make sure that it fits nicely if I were to place the same tile on both sides. That means that the edge of the grass matches up, the stone Bones match, etc. You're basically making a puzzle piece that fits perfectly with itself. That plain color tile in the middle is actually used to fill in the space where the player won't be able to explore. I usually make these a dark and less saturated color because you don't want it to become a point of focus. Because pixel art's biggest strength is its simplicity, you have to use those limitations to your advantage. The most important thing you want to think about is where you draw the player's attention. Areas with low saturated colors and and less detail are easy for the player to ignore, hence why the unreachable areas almost always go unnoticed. On the flip side, having brighter colors and more detail is a great way to show the player what they should be 
paying attention to. A great example of this is showing exactly where a player is able to walk. I use a very bright highlight color on all the surfaces of my ground tiles as a way to separate the play area from the background. I can't stress this enough, separating your tile sets based on color is probably the most important lesson I learned from making these. You'll see it a lot more as we continue this project. So using those same methods of making patterns, we end up creating this block of all these different surfaces. At this point, you pretty much have a tile set. You could use this to build the levels you need, but you'll notice that when we try to do that, there are these weird gaps in the corners. It's not terrible or anything, it just looks a little unpolished. The best way to fix that is to grab all of the flat sides of your tiles and line them up like this, and then draw in some new pieces to connect them. You want to be careful not to overwrite your existing tiles so they don't connect anymore. Just fill in the empty space with what you think would fit there. After that, you end up with a pretty polished looking tile set. Depending on what kind of game you're making, this is really all you need to start building out some level designs. For my game though, I want to take things a little bit further using layers. Layers are a way to separate tiles based on what purpose they serve. The layer we created so far is the ground layer. These are the tiles that will have colliders on them, making it so that the player doesn't fall right through. But we can also add some background layers too. Taking a look at the mood board reference we made earlier, I want some more industrial looking stuff to set the vibe of the tile set. The Willy Wonka reference I'm using has these cool looking pipes that Augustus Gloop gets stuck in, so I'm gonna make some pipes. Pipe systems are pretty fun to draw because you're really just making a bunch of different options and ways they can connect. Because these are elements in the background that we don't want drawing too much of the player's attention, again we want to keep these a bit darker than the ground layer. Depending on what your levels look like though, these background elements can be anything from bushes, rocks, trees, anything that you think can be reused multiple times throughout your levels. As long as you make it clear that these layers are separate, you can add as much variety to your tile set as you want. The best thing you can do is make up imaginary rules for yourself. Like I said, the things that the player can directly interact with are outlined with lighter highlights and the opposite for background objects. Another thing you can do is add another layer to add detail to the grass. I just added little tufts here and there, and it gives a bit of volume to the tiles. The reason you don't want this on the same layer as the ground is because they're still technically background elements, and you don't want stuff like this to have any collision for the player. Along those same lines, I added some rock structures, which can be pasted around to add some variety to the backgrounds. Remember, some games actually do thrive off of having less detail and variety, but in my case, I want to have as many options as possible. Stuff like this can always be changed and added later, so don't worry if you feel like it's not quite there yet. And the final thing I'll show you is the very back layer. Platformers are interesting in the way that there are so many different ways you can make backgrounds. Some people like making parallax backgrounds for levels. If you don't know what parallax means, it's basically a multi-layered background that moves based on the character's position, creating a sort of three-dimensional look. I'll probably end up making something like that in a future video, but for now, because I'm going for a warehouse vibe, I want everything to have closed-in walls. Depending Depending on your game, this will either be the darkest or brightest layer in your scene. The most important thing to pay attention to is how visible the player sprite is. You don't want the background to be so busy and detailed that it drowns the player out, especially when making a platformer. Having the player be super obvious and visible is really key. And just like that, we have ourselves a pretty solid looking tile set. I added a couple more plain pastel tile sets for the ground layer to really reach that effect I was looking for in my mood board. But now I feel like we're in a good place to start actually building some levels. We'll be putting those tile sets to use in the next devlog, so subscribe if you want to see that later this week. We also have a Discord server where you can share your own game projects. Feel free to join and and show us what tile sets you made. Thanks so much for watching, keep on gaming to the fullest, and I'll see you next time. Peace!